So I'd like to welcome Russ Day again into our congregation in a virtual way. You were here a week ago Saturday, and a number of us appreciated doing a workshop with you. And uh, I appreciated having some slides for our community life conversation that uh, you had provided for the workshop and attempted in 10 minutes to talk about what we had talked about in three hours. And so in another 10 minute segments, we'll attempt to sort of keep this conversation going a bit. So thank you for participating with us. Great, I had fun when I was up with you guys a couple of weeks ago. Uh, great, well, we did too. So uh, I thought with a basic question, people have been asking what's an adaptive conversation and why adaptive conversations are important for the church these days. Well, the easiest way to explain an adaptive conversation is to say what it's not. So it's neither a problem-solving process nor a strategic planning process. You know, there's lots of times when organizations, including churches, have to change. And some of those times we know clearly what the problem is that we have to adjust to. And sometimes we even know what some viable solutions would be so it's just a, a task of organizing, organizing ourselves to apply solutions to the problem skillfully. To be frank, churches are buried in such a massive process of social change and spiritual change that's going on over centuries. It's impossible to really know fully what the problem is or to problematize it. And so organizations that are in that kind of a, or communities that are in that kind of a situation, they have to do something different. Essentially, they have to go deeper. And, then, and they have to shift out of problem-solving mode as a primary mode to storytelling and narrative mode. And so they have to go deeply into their own story and have spiritual resources released to be applied to this situation. And churches find when they go deeply into their own story, they find there were previous generations that had similar challenges or equally deep ones. People in their own lives have had similar challenges. So you go deeply into a process of listening and storytelling to open this up. And then you go deeply into the story of the community around you, what's happening there. And you start to see ways that the faith community's story may speak to its context. Faith communities, churches have an especially rich way of doing this because we actually believe that God gets involved in this deep process. So we don't have to think our way all of the responses. We trust that uh, creativity and energy and insight and vision bigger and deeper than our own starts to reveal itself in this kind of a process. And then once that's happened, then you can switch to problem solving and strategic planning to implement, but you have to go deeper first. That's very helpful, that explanation. Uh, in that going deeper process uh, in your book, turning uh, ourselves inside out, you uh, describe going to different congregations that you were uh, doing as part of your study. And uh, some were more life-giving and some seemed to be in a process of dying. Can you describe how you came to describe that and um, the, the felt response? Sure. So I, I essentially borrowed language from the Freudian tradition. Because Freud came to early in his work to think that human beings had a life drive, which he called eros. And it expresses itself in creativity. It expresses itself in passions. It, exp it expresses itself in being deeply drawn to a connection. It, you know, eros is often thought of as sexual connection, but that was just one aspect. Any, you know, people who are passionately involved in their garden, that's arrows. Um, or people who are passionately involved with exploring nature, there's an arrow element. That's the life drive. As he got 
further into his career, he started to identify a death drive in some people, especially in traumatized people who kept revisiting the trauma in a way that didn't resolve anything. It just kept um, going back to the source of pain and then thereby, and in the process, making deathly decisions. His followers took another Greek word, thanatos, and, and so they held up thanatos as the opposite of eros, the, the life drive and the death drive. I think that in most mainline congregations now, the death drive is greater than the life drive. We keep making decisions that drive non-church people away. We keep having fights about money. We keep getting get stuck on the building. And we do it in a way that has really no view to mission or to attending to the life drive and what we're actually called to. So I think that um, a lot of congregations and a lot of courts of the church are caught in this death drive, which I think really um, ushers from denial of the fact that the church is, is fundamentally changing and that old models of church are dying. What I noticed when I went around visiting these thriving Christian communities that have been rec recommended to us, you'd walk in and you'd notice, oh, I don't feel the, the death drive. I, there's not these kind of defensiveness. There's not this fixation on the negative budgets. There's not this blame game. Blame game is a big friggin' part of the death drive. There was a, there was just not this mood of, oh, can we survive? Can we survive? Instead, there was a lightness, and their eyes were not focused on the problem. Their eyes were, were focused on something they were being called to, some form of creativity or, or mission or partnership. And you could smell it in, in the building. I have to say, my experience of the building and the people at St. Paul's is that you're ahead of the curve. I, I experienced there, there was some Thanatos in that conversation, but there was more arrows. And in the building and the choices you've made around it, there's lots of it. So I know there's fear, and I know that it's hard to swim in the United Church Sea and not get touched by Thanatos. But I was really encouraged by what I saw at St. Paul. Well, that's uh, heartening to hear. It's uh, always appreciative to hear some outside reflections and um and i think your energy was uh and brought some enthusiasm to us to carry on the conversations particularly at this time of year when we're always looking to the year ahead and do we have enough money all these kind of questions that are there but i, I think there is a genuine kind of inquisitiveness and and depth of conversation that we're willing to have and to look at it in a, a bigger context of who we are in this broader community so yeah i can see that so thank you this is a short but a very helpful discussion of uh, where we went in our workshop and i think where we will continue to go at saint paul's so thanks a lot Okay, good luck.